We live, live, okay. live, live, live. What's happening? It's Kamau and Stro. What it do? What's up, brothers? How What's we going doing? on? Hey, man, I'm, on? I'm ready for some more uh, Last Dance. I was in tears last night. <laughs> These two episodes were crazy. <laughs> crazy. Yeah, yeah, episode man. nine. Might have been the, episode nine might have been the best episode of the ten, for, in my opinion. It it was it was one the most emotional. Um, but in, in, in two, it just, it, it really kind of like put Steve Kerr's entire role into perspective and it, it was just a really good episode. So I, I love these last two. I agree. Yeah. Well, I, I, well, well, nah, you got I, it, I was brother. Just I, agree. I was just saying I agree. Hey, I'm looking forward to diving in, but uh, I enjoyed last time's debate so much. We're going to start off with another fact or fiction hot topic. Fact or fiction. Stro, the 72 win Bulls are the best team in NBA history. The 72 10, the 72 and 10 Bulls are the best team in history. That is a fact. That is a fact. Um, and I know people bring up the 73 win uh Warriors, but they didn't finish the they didn't finish the uh the task. So I think when I think in 96 or 90, 96, I think the thing they were saying, 72 and 10 don't mean a thing without that ring. And uh, 73 and 9 don't mean a thing because they didn't get a ring. <laughs> so it's it's, 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 all, it's all, you know, with me, with me, it's, you know, we, we, we get these debates that, you know, people bring rings up and is it all about rings? Yes. It's all about winning. It's all about finishing. <laughs> Who can't? Bill, Bill Walton always says, it doesn't matter if you don't win. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. I, I don't disagree there. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't contend that winning is the ultimate goal, that, that that doesn't matter most. I think the original question we were brainstorming was, if these two teams played, who would win? Um, and, and, and in that regard, I'm not convinced that the 72 uh, win Bulls would win. Um, I think that the offensive matchup for, well, okay. So let me preface my statement by saying it really depends on the rules they're playing by. If they're playing by the rules that they played um, in the 90s, okay, like that's a different conversation. But if they're playing by today's rules, I'm not sold that the 72 win Chicago Bulls could beat the 73 win uh, Warriors team. I think they're just offensively so dynamic that there's nobody um, who could really stop the the rain of threes. They would pour on them when it comes to threes. I think Curry is an offensive problem. I don't see anybody um, on that Bulls team being able to completely eliminate Curry from the game if they're playing in today's rules, right? If, if again, if, if you go back to those um, harsher 90s rules, of course they would just beat him down. But again, um, KD, same kind of problem. Just would rain threes on them all day long. But is 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 KD on the seventy three and nineteen? According to this graphic, it's shown. <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay, but look, but look. All right, the fact or fiction is the seventy two win Bulls are the best team ever. So we can cheat and we can throw any team we want at you. I'm, I'm gonna throw the 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 year that the uh, Warriors got KD. And, and, and I'm trying to imagine those teams playing together. And here's the case I would make for that team. When we saw in Last Dance, the Bulls go up against the Jazz back to back. That was no easy feat, right? People just kind of remember that as, as a walk through the park. But the Jazz took the Bulls six games. And even in those closeout games where the Bulls won in game six, it was not easy either way. It, it came down to the last couple of minutes for them to be able to clinch. And I'm comparing those teams. And I'm thinking, all right, let's just say that different skill set, but Steph Curry and John Stockton, let's say they cancel each other out. they both really great at different things, but let's, can't, let's say they cancel each other out. Then, in an insult to KD, let's go ahead and assume that KD and Carmelo, they cancel each other out. They were both really great at different things, but let's just go ahead and say they cancel each other out, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, KD, if you're watching this, I apologize <laughs> to you. I apologize to you alone. Okay. Now, beyond that, who on that you who on those Utah Jazz teams can be a match to Clay Thompson? Who on those Jazz teams are a match to
to Draymond Green. I don't think there is a third guy or a fourth guy on those Jazz teams that can step up and, and, and hang with one of those guys on the Warriors teams. And the Bulls struggle with those Jazz teams. Listen, man, the Chicago Bulls in, in um, 1996, Michael Jordan had come back for a first full season. And it was, it was um, you know, after being retired. And just the sting of losing to who I thought was a, a lesser team with the Orlando, Orlando Magic, his mentality was just different. So when all that, you take all that into, into play, um, it's just hard for that team to lose. And the reason that it's hard for them to lose to a team like um, the Golden State Warriors, um, no matter what rules we're using, the 73 win team, you know, without KD, it's easier for them just, just defensively because the because of the, the, the way the Bulls play defense, no matter what rules uh, are in play here, they were a defensive-minded team. And as a coach, I always say, you win championships by one stop and one basket at a time. So if you can get more stops than the other team and then score when you're stopping them, you're going to win every time. And because of the Bulls' size, because of their dedication to defense, and um, because of Michael Jeffrey Jordan, I got I to gotta give them the edge um, in that year over anybody they played in the history of the league. All right, but if we're guarding that Warriors team, Jordan can only guard yeah. one guy, right? So mm -hmm. let's say he guards Steph. You can give him Clay if you want, but let's just say he guards Steph. Yeah. And let's assume he locks him down. Pippen is guarding KD. Let's assume that Pippen locks KD down. And I, I got no, mad respect for Pippen. We can't assume that. No, like they, I want to assume no. it. I want to assume it. Then let's say Robin locks up Draymond Green. We still got Clay. Who's guarding Clay? Well, at, at that point, you you still have a very long and lengthy Ron Harper. Now, listen, I know people uh, will look at me strange when I say things like that, but Ron Harper was uh, he was crafty on the defensive end, whether it's grabbing you, whether it's pulling you. The running is going to wear him down, but you, you have Rodman, you have uh, uh, the uh, scrappy Randy Brown coming off the off the bench, hurting guys. But but the deep, the defensive end of it is just that one part of it. Because if you go down on the other end, who's going to stop Michael? So if 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 these guys get into this sort of mental battle that they'll probably get into. I'm always giving Mike the edge, and and still we and we're I don't know why we're throwing KD on the 73 win team. KD's if KD's on the 73 <laughs> win team. They <laughs> so that that's a different story. This KD wasn't on that team. Now if we just talk about the Kate, if we talk about the KD Warriors, of course that's a different thing. But I don't uh, listen. Scottie Pippen can guard anybody, man, and so KD would have had he would have struggled with Scotty a little bit. Uh, these other guys he had to play. Scottie Pippen, 6'9", long arms, um, very dedicated on the defensive end. KD is going to always get his money, but he would have had a tougher time against Scottie Pippen. I think the last thing I'm going to say about this is that um, the Bulls were a lockdown defensive team in, like, in that style of play, which was, um, you know, post up, which was go for the mid-range. Like, they, they could beat just about – I mean, and they did beat just about any team defensively. Um, they were able to really do the gridlock, but they didn't have players who were pulling up from 40 feet. And three guys on this Golden State team can pull up from 40 feet. They don't need to play inside of the arc. And I think the way that they move, if it came to an offensive battle, the Golden State Warriors would outscore them, just point blank, period. Yeah, but, you know, defense wins championships. That's why Golden State wins championships. They play, they play team defense. And on the 73 win team, they had two guys that can pull up from the from 40 feet. Also, if we're playing with those same rules, when you when Michael Jordan can go to the rim without being touched, he's going to score 50 every game he plays in that finals. Yeah, you, you know, one of the things I think gets left out of these debates about which team would win playing across different time periods is teams were designed for their greatest rival. Right. Like like yeah. you, you didn't build yeah. teams out of the abstract. Like the reason you got that particular Bulls team is because they were building four teams like the Knicks for the Pacers. You look at that Pacers team. They matched up so well with the Bulls because they designed themselves for that. So to, to use an example with Golden State, the first year they beat Cleveland, Cleveland was yeah. not a great three point yeah. shooting team. 
what happens? Cleveland come, comes back that next year, and they're like in the top three or four teams in the NBA for three-point shooting, and they were like right there with Golden State having all those gunners because – they adjusted their team to match who they knew they needed to beat when they got to the finals. And so, you know, we wouldn't even be looking at the teams that would be playing each other. If they played in the same era, they would be making strategic adjustments to get the talent that they need to beat them. You know, the Bulls would probably have, you know, a, about three or four more Steve Kerr type players. They would probably, you know, invest less in having, you know, a Bill Cartwright and a Luke Longley. They would have more scrapplers and things along those lines. So it's always such a hard, hard thing to say. But here, here's my ne next fact of fiction. One of the big themes in Last Dance was this, this sense of, it, it was the biggest theme. It was this sense of like, man, this is a team that could have won forever. And, and, and it just ended in the saddest way. They Like nobody knocked the Bulls off their pedestal. So fact or fiction, if that same Bulls team had returned, would they have a fact or fiction? They would have won a seventh championship. Um, I'm gonna say fact that they would have won, but I'm not as sure as I was with number six. But I'm I am gonna say fact, uh, because you know I just can't go against Mike Jordan, but. The way Indiana, the Indiana Pacers played, played them, if they had faced them again, and let's say they had home court advantage, um, they it would have been tough. But I will say this too, that it was a shortened season. Um, Michael Jordan wouldn't, wouldn't have had to play so many games. Scotty wouldn't have had to play so many games. Uh, I'm going to say fact, but but it's it's not as sure as I want it to be. Yeah, I think if I had to um, to chime in, I would say I want to say fact. Um, I, but it, it, it's really hard to say. I, I think, um, especially at coin toward the end of the season, you really saw in that final stretch uh, that Scottie Pippen was having a lot of trouble, cold, like physically. Um, and I think the the players on that team were getting older. Um, and 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 the kind of workloads that they were like that they were burdened with was tough. So to not be able to rebuild and, and add more pieces um, as a supporting cast, I think it would have just been a tough feat, especially going against um, you know the young gunners that they had in in their same conference in in Indiana. I think they were a stacked team. I think even you know arguably it was said that that last. Um, that last episode or that last dance, you know, that last uh, playoff series in the Eastern Conference Finals, Utah, I mean, uh, Indiana was the better team, but they had more pieces. That, um, But I think, you know, that championship dynasty, that DNA, that, uh, that just experience came to fruition for those Bulls and they were able to get the job done. But I think, you know, younger teams like Indiana, uh, obviously um, – you know, the Utahs of the world, but, you know, I think there was going to be a lot more competition um, and it, it just would have been harder, but there's no, there's no information or evidence that leads me to believe that they couldn't have done it again. Um, it, it's just, it's just one of those tough what ifs. Yeah. I, I'll call fiction on it. Not because I don't believe that team couldn't have won, but I don't believe that team could have stayed together. Uh, I think, um, I think we saw Scottie Pippen mentally give everything that he could and put up with everything that he could in order to keep his head in the game. And I think he would have done exactly as he had chosen. He was demanding to be traded when he had when he had Jordan. And he pushed through and, and just, you know, felt like I, I gotta do what I gotta do until my contract's over because they're gonna find me or whatever. But I think a lot of his physical ailments, you know, were a part of that mental battle. And I think he would have got out of there. I, I think Scotty would have left. And I, I just don't think that team could have recovered quickly enough to replace that kind of talent and experience, you know, to be able to overcome a Pacers team that just took them to seven games the previous year. Because I believe that Pacers team would have ran it back and, and maybe added another piece to beef up. <laughs> maybe they would have signed Scotty, <laughs> but they would have added another piece. <laughs> And I think they would have overcame the, uh, the Bulls. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been hilarious? Scotty goes to the that Pacers. And then... 
<laughs> hey, spe speaking of, let's talk about that Pacers Bulls uh, series, man. I, I know Reggie went into that with the mindset of, I'm not scared of Michael Jordan. He said a lot of yeah. people respected him, a lot of people feared him, but he was willing to take it straight to him. And it doesn't get talked about a lot. You know, the Bulls, they didn't go to a lot of game sevens. And this might have arguably been the toughest team they had to play against. Kamal, what, what jumped out at you when, when you were looking at that part of the documentary? I think that whole series was really interesting, right? Like, I think episode nine starts off with these two dudes fighting, like in the middle of a scrap. Um, and then he goes on to say exactly what you just said. Like, I wasn't afraid of him. Um, and one of the things that David Jaw just said that I thought was cool was that Reggie was a problem that he had just insane confidence. And when he was on, he was on. He was a dead um, dead shot shooter. And I, it, it was just really cool to kind of see him at that peak, you know, being able to hit those game winners. I think it was game three, right? When he, he hit the game winner. Was that it against the Bulls? I believe it was four. Hit, I think that's game four. Okay. Um, what, what I thought was really interesting during game four is when, you know, when that play was about to be drawn up and they, they cut to Larry Bird and Larry Bird was essentially just like, you know, when I was coaching, we always had a lot of last minute plays that were drawn up. So, you know, at the end of the game, we weren't scrambling. Like we knew the play we were going to run. And I thought that was just, I mean, that was, a, that was a key to greatness right there, right? Like just as a coach, being able to prepare your guys for those those last minute situations, a lot of teams like, you know, they, they kind of have to imp improvise or they, they might, you know, have one one play that is kind of their go to. But he had a couple and he made sure that guys knew what to do under pressure. And I think that preparation um, was just key. And, and, and it really like helped them get to a game seven with uh, the talented Bulls team. I, I was just really impressed um by that just you know that commitment to preparation and just being able to act when the moment comes yeah uh you know reggie reggie wasn't afraid of anybody he didn't fear michael jordan he didn't fear anybody uh as a matter of fact i wrote a rap some years ago called i got a j and one of the lines was i shoot like reggie miller better yet the miller killer like michael jeffrey jordan i'm a basket filler so Miller Miller came at Mike, but Mike would always, um, you know, he overcame uh, Reggie. But Reggie was not afraid. The team was built as as uh, Jalen was um, narrating the part of it. They were they were built. They were they had a big guy. They had the the big guy in the middle. They had the Davis boys. They had Mark Jackson, and then they had Miller, who was a killer, and he wasn't afraid. And and the Bulls edged him out because they were they were tough. And they were well coached. Uh, Larry Bird had a great coaching staff with him, and Reggie Miller would hit big shots. But I think that, if I'm not mistaken, watching that game, uh, that game seven, I don't know how what kind of fourth quarter Reggie Miller really had in that game. Uh, and so that's what that's what led to my rap ly lyrics. Uh, better yet, the Miller killer. That uh, was Michael Jordan. He was the Miller killer. Because but everybody else, uh, Reggie would would go against. He would uh, most times in, in clutch situations he would come up, but uh, not as clutch as MJ. So, but but the series in itself, I would say that I will say this is that out of all six championships, that was when I was the most fearful of them not mm -hmm. making it. I really thought that after when Reggie hit that shot in Game Four, and they they were just you know playing so good and they were matched up so well, and then anything can happen in a Game Seven. And would a guy who was as clutch as Reggie Miller, um, you just, you, I wasn't sure that the Bulls uh, would win, but they did come come out with the victory, of course. Yeah, they got huge breaks, man. I mean, the Pacers came out so strong in that game seven. I, I mean, yeah. they, they were up pretty convincingly. They looked great. And, and I remember Jordan going on the bench for a couple of minutes and then, you know, coming back, finding his groove popping it out to Kerr for that three, that jump shot, giving it to Scotty for that layup. It was it was like, okay, okay, maybe we can get back in this game. But you didn't know with two minutes left to play, like you didn't feel any security at all. I mean, that 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 team was really tough. And I I, I like the I like the part about um, Miller saying that he wasn't afraid of Jordan. 
it, it reminds me of um, in baseball the year that I believe it was Mark McGuire and then Sammy Sosa in the same year that they, they both broke the Roger Maris record for um, you know sixty one home runs in a single season and and as those guys got close. I remember every pitcher was trying harder to either strike those guys out or to walk them, right? It, it was like, we ain't giving you nothing. We are not about to <laughs> honor you and just let you break Roger Maris's record. You're going to have to beat us legit. And, and that's the thing about competitive sports I love the most. The way you pay respect to greatness is trying mm -hmm. to compete, trying to beat you. And, and, and that's what I loved about Kobe. Kobe respected MJ. But he respected him enough to say, I want to be the one to beat you. I want to take the crown away from you. And um, you, you just got to love that because ultimately when those guys achieve things, it makes it matter all the more that nobody just stepped aside and gave it to him. You know, speaking of not stepping aside and just giving it to them, let's let, let's rewind like the documentary did to that 97, 98 series against the Jazz, that first championship series. And, you know, I want to talk about, you know, a memorable moment from that, which was what was known as the flu game. But what we find out in this documentary is this story that's probably got every piece of place in Utah on alert right now. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the guys are up hanging out late. Jordan got really hungry. They ordered a pizza. And, and Tim Grover says there were five delivery guys that brought this piece into the door. And they're all just kind of looking in, trying to see what's going on. Nobody else ate. I don't know what that was about. Jordan was the only one that ate. And uh, Tim Grover said he had a feeling that something was wrong. And then Jordan says he ate the whole pizza, the entire thing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then just proceeds to have a night from hell and, and, and a terrible day the next day when he's got to play for a game five, man. I mean, it'd be one thing if you're up 2-1, you can sit and take it easy. Game five, you can't go down 3-2 with the way the Utah Jazz were playing. Uh, Stro, what, what does that flu game mean to you, man? What stands out to you about that whole game? Well, first of all, if you've never had food poisoning, that thing didn't resonate with you. I've had food poisoning before, and it made me appreciate even more um, what Michael Jordan did that night. Uh, and the second thing, a friend of mine, uh, who a former colleague of mine put on Facebook the other day, like, come on, Mike, you from Chicago and you ordering pizza in Utah. So, <laughs> you know, you, you gotta go better than that. You know what I mean? Uh, but for, for just to watch his will in that particular game was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. And I, 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 just like I said before, if you've never experienced what kind of pain that and the thing that's, it's like a flu times 10 um, with with uh, food poisoning. And for him to come out and like when his mom said, you know, maybe you don't need to play, but it's, it was just so telling how winning was everything to him. So I'll just go through it because I know we have to win this game. And there's no way we're winning this game in Utah if I'm not playing. I don't care who's out there. They're not going to beat Utah without Michael Jordan. And for him to come out and to do what he did, like he did it, while ill that in that in that manner, you know, just watching him go to the bench and, you know, the sweat pouring from him, you know, trying to drink as much Gatorade he's, as he possibly can, and just knowing what that feels like, I know I couldn't have did it. I was just like, hey, guys, I'm sorry. We just got to fight hard after <laughs> when we get back. Uh, but it was just amazing to see and the appreciation I have for his competitive nature and how winning was always everything to him, no matter how he felt. And it also says, it tells a story like when he, when he was saying to Scotty, oh, you got a headache? Okay, what does that mean? Let's play. And so that's, and he proved it there. And because when you got food poisoning, you have a headache, you're nauseous, you can't see, you get, and it took amazing wheel for him to come out to do what he did that night and uh, i'll never forget it yeah yeah i think starting from um starting from the end right <clears throat> the end of that game he left that game having had played 44 minutes and scoring 38 points hmm. like that entire night just up throwing up 
um, you know, had been in bed all day to score 38 points in 44 minutes of hardcore play where they're double teaming you, triple teaming you, um, and you're still getting buckets. You're still willing yourself. Um, and, you know, uh, every time out, Bill Cartwright was just saying, like, he would – every time out when they called the whistle or they blew the whistle, you could just see Michael's body just kind of, like, collapse. Um, and, and, and just that sheer exhaustion, you know – this wasn't, um, you know, like uh, first couple weeks of the season. This was the finals. This was after a very, very long season where your body is already exhausted. Um, and and for him to will himself, I mean, was just amazing. And one of the things that Scotty said was, you know, a lot of the time when you're sick, you're able to find something deep down that you didn't know was there. I don't know, like, who, who he's been talking to, but when I'm sick – there's nothing deep down except like stomach acid. I'm I'm not trying to dig and deep and become this lion. I'm trying to lay in bed. So I don't know how they get sick, but <laughs> the way that he was sick, um, it, it it just defies human nature. His ability to do that, um, and and it, it was it was frankly just amazing. Like I don't even I think like one of the things that the announcers was saying that I really liked is that. You know, he was shooting free throws at, at the end of the game, and they were saying, you know, the confidence, the poise, the discipline of this Bulls team is paying off right now in this fourth quarter. And I think that that's what you're able to rely on. You know, when when your body is given out on you, um, you know, when your teammates are given out on you, it's it's those three things. It's that confidence. It's that poise and that, it's that discipline that you had been putting in all season long, all, you know, the offseason beforehand. Um to, to be able to get to that place, right? Like, I don't think even NBA players today aren't aren't able to get to that place because um, you can't you can't just do that. There's a lot of legwork, a lot of groundwork that has to be laid um, before you can ask that of um, each other, of of yourself, you know, of your body, of your mentality. Like, a lot of legwork has to be laid before you can go down there um, and find that um, that that switch, that next level. Um, and, and I, I think that's just something that very few people on this earth are able to do. And, and he did it and, and dropped 38 points while doing it. Yeah, man. One of the things this documentary and a lot of people's reaction to it made me realize to my surprise is just how controversial work ethic can be. Um, hmm. I, I never thought that, you know, I've always been the type of person who feels like if there's something that you want out of life or something that's important to you, you work your butt off and you get out there, you just get after it. And there are a lot of people out there who just see Jordan as this unhealthy workaholic. And this is another example of a guy that was so obsessed with winning that he just put winning at any cost above his own health. And I think there are lessons about what it means to be a leader that get missed when you kind of interpret Jordan in that way. Uh, he wasn't the kind of guy who wouldn't take a day off if he knew that his body wouldn't agree with him. He dealt with an injury where he had to set out an entire season and he had to think about the long term. So his love for the game didn't make him irrationally committed to just pushing himself to his own hurt. But he was a man that understood context. And this is what every leader has to do. When your team is up 2-0 and you need a day off, okay, maybe that's the time to take it. When you're up 2-1 and you really need a day off, all right, maybe that's the time to coast a little bit. But they're tied 2-2, two to two, two to two. the Utah Jazz have won the last two games, and now they're in Utah in a really difficult place to win. This is a must-win game. Like, your team needs that kind of, like, energy to, to find their faith with their backs against the wall. And this was a moment where Jordan said, all right, I, I would love to take a day off, but I'm not Dennis Rodman. You know, like I can't go take a vacation in the middle of war. I have to be there for my team. And what I love about his mindset is I don't think Jordan knew coming into it that this would be one of his best games ever. I don't think he made the decision in the first quarter, I'm going to score 44 points and I'm going to have the moment with Scotty where I fall into his arms and everybody will be inspired by it. What he said at that time was he knew that even though he wasn't ready to give his best, at least he could be a decoy. 
he knew that the that that the other team had to at least respect his presence and maybe that could you know help facilitate the other guys help make it easier on them to be able to score so he kind of had that mindset in i'm just going to show up i'm going to be present i'm going to do the best that i can but hopefully it'll make it easier on the other guys by me drawing so much attention and somewhere in that second half a switch went off and jordan realized if we're going to win at all like it or not I can't rely on the other guys to make it happen. I'm going to have to step up and have a great game. And at that moment, he chose to do it. And so I think there's a valuable lesson there, too, about sometimes you have to just put yourself in a space where greatness can happen. You know, you, you don't always know when your great moments are going to be. And you don't always step into every moment going, this is going to be a 44-point game. Sometimes you step into those moments and just say, hey, being present, being available is better than the alternative. So let me just be present and let's see what happens. And then you have that moment where you realize, okay, it's time for me to ascend to greatness, you know? Let's talk about uh let's talk about fathers, man. I, you know, one of the things I like about about this uh this documentary is that it kind of stepped away from Jordan for a minute and it put the spotlight on somebody else. You feel like this is a, a long commercial for the greatness of Jordan sometimes, but I like how they zoomed in on Steve Kerr and his relationship to basketball and his relationship to his father. Um, and, and, and then they worked in Jordan's relationship to his father figure, Gus. Stro, I'd I like to hear what from you, like what stood out to you about Kerr's role with the Bulls and, and just how his, father's, uh, how his father's death affected him? Well, first of all, I, I didn't know that story at all. Like I, I, mm. I hadn't mm. heard about that. And mm. um, so it put me in a place, I mean, I was so sad um, because maybe I was one of the few people who had never heard the story before and the kind of work his father was doing and the sort of danger he put himself in to do it. Um, it, it really, I can tell you, it broke my heart. I mean, I, I was so saddened by it, but the way it sort of, uh, caused Steve to, um, sort of get even more serious about his sport, uh, what he was doing, um, and eventually caused him to be who he was and ended up where he did. And only that that showed me how effective relationships can be and which way you can go. Like some some sometimes things, when things happen that tragic to people, it can cause them to turn differently and, and like just give up and say that my dad didn't deserve this. You know, he left us, I'll just, you know, go on and, you know, just give up. But it seemed to, to me that it turned Steve into this strong person. Like he he uh, always said Steve Kerr was a tough guy. He didn't look like he was tough, you know, to stand up to Michael Jordan and, and then to be ready to hit some of the shots that he hit. And then now to see the kind of coach that he is, um, I see that it was though that sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, that sort of trauma that he went through losing someone like your dad who he was obviously you know, that was a that was a family they seemed close-knit and it seemed uh that that can affect you in in one good way or in a bad way and it seemed to affect steve in a good way and it also gave me more respect for someone who can survive out of something like that and be the guy that he turned out to be i've always liked steve kerr um since the time i heard that he stood up to michael jordan years ago when it first happened and it was and it, and it came out, but this even made me um, look up to him more to go through something that he did. And, you know, Steve was a guy that you can count on, um, whether it be a shot, whether it be him, you know, being tough and scrappy, um, he gave us all. Um, but uh, to see him overcome that sort of trauma in his life um, was pretty amazing to me. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. I um I, I too had never heard the story and, and it caught me completely by surprise. I, I I frankly don't think a lot of people have heard that story. I, I think that it was new news to a lot of us. Um and I think I think one, you know, it was just interesting that, you know, he started off by talking about you know his relationship with Michael Jordan and his position um in that on that Bulls team. And how, you know, he had a hard time getting into the league and then getting to that Bulls team. He had a scratch, fight, and claw for every single moment, every single shot, 
every single opportunity that he had. He, he was a fighter. And I think um, that's why Michael respected him. And that's why he, you know, got those shots when, when the team needed them. That's why he was past the ball because um, they knew he had the character and, and what he went to, uh, he, he went on and talked about just how it was pretty tough connecting with Michael, that Michael lived this just different life than the rest of them. Um, and that for a lot of reasons, like he doesn't blame Mike. He think he he thinks Mike had to do it out of necessity. But, you know, the case was that Mike just a lot of times wasn't available emotionally um, to connect with that team. He was just really difficult to reach. And, and then the interviewer asked him, like, had you guys ever talked about you know, the dads, like you guys' shared experience, um, shared tra traumatic experience. Then it, you know, took us to this whole backstory of, of, of Steve's, uh, Steve Curry's dad. Just so sad, so sad. Um, and, and I think what, you know, TK, I, I'd love to hear you comment on this um, once you go next. But one of the things that his wife said, he, his wife said two things that stood out to me. One that, the work that Steve Kerr's dad was doing, he was really connected to. He was um, the professor of Middle Eastern politics and that, you know, he became the president of Beirut University. And it, it was just the realization of a dream. And I think, you know, one, to see your dad be able to do that, right? To see your dad be able to realize your dream, um, I think says a lot because that means he had to work his butt off to get there. Anybody who realizes their dreams, you know, they work to get to where they were at. And, you know, his wife went on to say that, like, it was the real late, the realization of a dream, um, but just one that didn't last very long. And I think that, you know, that's what really pulled on your heart. And then he went on to say that, you know, he be he was targeted because he represented a government that stood for values that were contrary you know, to that, to that militia. And, and I, and I just thought that there was just a lot of, um, a lot of notions to just high character, high moral character, you know, strong values. And I think that was, that was just very clear in, uh, that was very abundant in, in, in Steve Kerr's upbringing. And he was able to bring that with him, you know, as he faced adversity after adversity, you know, throughout his playing career. And, and I think that's where, I think that's what father figures, that's what parental figures, um, that's what mentors can do for you is, is they instill those strong values and that, you know, commitment to high and moral character. And I think, you know, mentioning or um, talking about the point you t mentioned, TK, about Gus and uh, Michael Jordan's relationship with his entourage or his security guards, it was the same kind of thing. It was you know, these older guys that surrounded Mike and they gave him good advice and they were able to pass down these lessons and um, their wisdom and, and, and just gave him the maturity um, and to make these sound principles, these sound principle decisions. And, and I think that's just so invaluable. And it was really cool for me because I like to hang out around older guys. Um, I like to just kind of sit in the back and listen and, and chime in here and there. And I get a lot out of that. And it was interesting, you know, to see somebody at who, 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 who just, who's won at the highest level, who's exceeded at the highest levels, um, you know, of any competitive uh, endeavor, Michael Jordan. And to hear him talk about how, how much he values having those older figures in his life, how much he values that wisdom, how much it helped him when it really counted. So I, I, I thought just, you know, the whole, that whole aspect of episode nine was just so powerful and, and really connected with me on a deep level. And, and, and in a lot of ways, it's like, you know, it, it shows the power that, you know, strong elders can have on the younger generation and, and what that looks like um, in, in practical, but much needed situations. Yeah, Stro, you mentioned that you didn't know about Kerr's father. I didn't know about Gus. Did did y'all know about that? I I knew about Gus, um, but not in this sort of, you know, in this way. Of course, with the cameras in the in the back, you know, being able to see. But I, I knew about Gus, you know, um, people who follow Mike that closely knew about Gus, but not to the extent of the documentary showing us how he filled the roles. I mean, it makes sense that he did, but he filled the role of his father. When his father passed, uh, 
but I, I did know that Gus was always around. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think it's another one of those moments that really humanizes MJ, right? I mean, yeah. to, to know that he had this soft spot in his heart for this older guy that kind of reminded him of his dad. And, and then when they show Gus with the game ball, you know, and, and him saying, you know, pointing out that it was really special that Mike uh, – <laughs> Mike gave it to him. That uh, I I got I got a little choked up when I saw that man, but you know I, one thing I'd say about um, Kerr's dad, you know, one of the lessons that really popped out to me there about Kerr's father and, and your point, Kamau, about just the 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 passion and sense of purpose that that he had, even though you know his dream was only fulfilled for a short amount of time, is that one of the greatest gifts I think a father can give uh, to his children is the gift of purpose. And, and I think sometimes we, we can define love exclusively in terms of giving people our presence, you know, be, be around for conversation, be around for, for quality time, recreation or what have you. But there's also something to be said about being a parent who, who has something that, that gives you a sense of calling and you devote your life to it. And, 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 and you can model for your children what it means to live for something that's greater than impulse, greater than the present moment, to be a part of some fight, some battle, some cause that that is capable of enduring your lifetime, to have a legacy. And, and I don't think that lesson was lost on Steve. And, and I think, like his mother said, when, when the father passed away, he poured himself into basketball. And I don't think that was a form of denial. I, I, I think this is another one of those things that can be hard to imagine if you don't love something like sports. But for him, it was, it was both catharsis and a way of celebrating his father's legacy by saying, you know what? My father went after the thing that gave him a sense of meaning. I'm gonna dedicate myself to the best that I can with this thing that gives me a sense of meaning. And, and I, I remember them talking about John Paxson and, and, and Paxson said that, you know, he, he gave some mentorship to Steve Kerr and he told him that, you know, he realized that he was a, a role player a long time ago and he accepted that. And, and that was mm -hmm. crucial to his success. And I, th I think there's a powerful insight there too about recognizing that glory is bigger than being the number one guy, the guy that the documentary is about, you know, um, that, that you can be the hero of your own story in a way that doesn't require you to be the, the lead actor in everybody else's story. And Kerr wasn't a, an a, jo a Jordan, but he was part of a legacy that's gonna endure the test of time because he was willing to accept what his role was and and not despise it. and and. And in some ways that made it harder for him because he didn't have the luxury of knowing that he can have 15 shots a game. You know, it's like, hey man, you're gonna get three shots a game. You gotta make them count. You know, and he was able to accept that and um, and step up to it. I, th I thought that was pretty amazing. Everybody, if, if you're watching right now live, feel free to let us know on Twitter or Facebook if you got any any uh, questions that you want us to that you want to ask us or anything that you want to talk about. Um, while those are coming in, you know, one thing, guys, that that I didn't know, another thing is uh, that at the end of this era, Reinsdorf actually offered Phil an opportunity to stay. Even though Jerry Krause opens up this documentary by saying, I don't care if you win 82 games, this is your last, this is your last hurrah. You're not coming back. Reinsdorf has a has a change of heart. Um, Stro, what what was up with that? And what do you think about Phil's decision? Did he did he make the right call? I think uh, first of all, I was shocked. I I don't recall that at all in '98 being the case, um, but I think that we saw like the underlying pressure of everybody and the way they dominated and winning and and that kind of thing, and then him asking. But I don't know who who said it, but I heard someone say um, that Phil's uh, relationship with Jerry was just too far gone. And it made me think about what Kamal was talking about, egos and, and that kind of thing. I don't think uh, Phil Jackson or, uh, I mean, Jerry Cross wouldn't have had a choice, but I don't think Phil Jackson was was uh, willing to go through another 82 games or whatever, 50 games as it turned out to be with Jerry Krauss, um, no, no matter what. I don't think that he wanted to go through that. I think his ego had been hurt. Um, at the beginning of the year when he was like, I don't care if they go 82-0, and 0, Phil's not going to be our coach anymore. And I think that sat with him. So no matter what Jerry said, um, Phil, Phil just wasn't, you know, going to be disrespected like that and then come back and then ruin his sort of uh, 
you know, last dance narrative that he had given to the guys and wanted to finish on top. Um, so I think that everybody, now everybody's looking like, oh my God, Phil, you know, you're the reason. But I think that Phil also, outside of what I think um, was his feelings, was that like, it's like you all, like you mentioned earlier, TK, that you don't know if Scotty's going to come back. Uh, you don't know if I want to, do I feel like dealing with Dennis for another um, season <laughs> and, and all these kind of things? You know what I'm saying? Like, that that's a lot for somebody who was really putting a lot of um, emotional effort into keeping these guys together. Um, I was shocked. I didn't know that was an option. But I do also understand why it didn't happen um, because of what Jerry said early in the year. No matter what Reinsdorf said afterwards, you know, Reinsdorf could have made it happen, but I don't think Phil was willing to um, be around Jerry again, nor do I think that he had the energy um, to hold all of those personalities um, together. Yeah, if I, if I could build on Stroh's point, I think uh, to the thing about the dynamic between, you know, Jerry Krause and um, Phil Jackson's relationship, I think... Uh, Phil Jackson just wasn't getting a lot of respect for the kinds of work that he was doing um, and, and, and the way that he was going about doing it. I think uh, what, what, was, what was super um, impressive to me is when episode 10 started out, they started talking about um, just how Jordan was different. And it wasn't because of his athleticism. It was that he was able to be present. That his, his presence, his focus, um, his ability to eliminate all of the distractions and really zone in on the present moment and perform was the separator from him. And I think Phil Jackson, you know, I believe he played a large part in that and in, in, in cultivating that mindset and cultivating that focus. You know, a lot of the things that Phil Jackson did were just different. You know, they came from these Buddhist and Native American principles where he was having the guys do yoga. He was having the guys do like breathing techniques, you know, before they were going into that 98 finals, that's what he asked the team. Like, Hey guys, I told you about um, breathing. I told you about staying centered and, and, and remaining focused. And I think, I think like that's a process that that's, that's a process to excellence and it needs room to breathe. You can't have a general manager breathing down your neck when you're doing something that's innovative, that's creative, um, that's trailblazing a different direction. You know, this isn't a standard coach and he has the rings to prove it. And I think his process, um, it had already proven that it was a winning process. And I think for him not to have that respect at that point, it, it was just, it was, it was kind of ridiculous. It was like, why not? I have the rings to prove it. Um, I shouldn't even have to, to fight this fight anymore. And I think he was able to go on to LA, my team, and get those rings for us. Um, and he had the space to do that. And and I think, and I, and I think that's just, you know, for him, again, like Shro was saying, people could think it was a selfish selfish move, but I think he had already proven what needed to be proven. Um, up until that point. And I think just because there wasn't enough respect and he was still on this pseudo tight leash that it was just, you know, it wasn't going to work. Yeah. You know, that, that's that got to be the ultimate vindication too, right? Um, for someone to tell you on day one, I don't care if you win 82 games, you're not coming back. I'm ready to rebuild. And then, and then you go and win in a way that puts pressure on that guy to replace you with somebody that that can justify his decision to break the team up. Because, you know, if, if the Bulls had lost, if they got eliminated by the Pacers or something like that, it would have made Krause look vindicated, you know? I mean, hey, it's time to break this team up. You know, they're just a little bit too old to get, you know, get over the hump. It, it's time to move on. And when you move on, there's something sweet about people saying, no, don't go. We want you to stay. We can win it again versus people being like, yeah, it's about time for you to go, man. Like we've seen the very best that you have to offer. And so from Phil's vantage point, it doesn't get any better than that. I can't imagine him leaving on a higher note than one that has us sitting here thinking that he probably would have won a seventh championship if he came back. Um, I, I, I agree with Stroh on this one. I think 
there's something about telling a guy at the beginning of the year that this is his last last go round that that causes him to make mental adjustments. You you know when someone says you, you don't have your job next year, you're probably going to be for those first few weeks like stressed and anxious and worried because you don't know what what happens next. But a few months in, you got to start coping, and you have to start thinking about what you're going to do next. You have conversations with people that you know and that you love. You get advice. You put your game plan together, and there comes a point where you decide what it's going to be. You make peace with what it is. You kind of get your game plan for what you're going to do next, and you can't just walk it back at that point. And and I can't imagine how many moments Phil got himself through by saying, you know what, this is the last season anyway. You know, when, when Rodman goes off to the WWE, you know, and you're frustrated, <laughs> you know, he, he probably was like, hey, you know what, season's almost over. It doesn't matter. Like it, it doesn't matter. Let's just let's just get through this and do the best that we can. So, I, and I think the fact that he had a, had some time off and was able to go to LA and repeat his three feet. Um, if you need an argument that he made the right call for Phil, I think that might be the right. I think that might be the argument right there. But what's up with Rodman, man? Like I, I, I thought <laughs> Vegas was it, but <laughs> but Carmen Electra makes a second appearance to tell us about. <laughs> That's an epic photo. <laughs> this brother, man. What, what, what's, what's up with you guys, bro? I, I mean, I don't, I mean, at this point, it's just like Dennis being Dennis and, and uh, funny and ridiculous at the same time. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> the, like I'm, I'm going off to wrestle like with Hulk Hogan you know, in the midst, it's just, you know, again, it's funny and ridiculous at the same time. I mean, it, it's just who Dennis was. Um, but, but beyond what I feel like a person should be, a teammate should be, one, no one can argue the effort he gave on the court. What I think what was so amazing to me is that he's able to go and party and to drink. Like I, I, I was speaking to someone and they were saying, well, like, Michael Jordan didn't have food poisoning. He was like, he was drunk. And I'm like, probably not. Like, I, you know, Mike disrespected the game too much. Like Dennis Rodman had developed this sense of, I can get drunk, I can do whatever. I can go have a, <laughs> a tag team wrestling match with <laughs> with Hulk Hogan and still come back and get 16 rebounds and, and play incredible defense on Carl Malone, who would eventually wrestle with him later. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's just you know Dennis Rodman was amazing man it was it, it was he's he's hard to he's hard to to read uh but you you could not deny his intelligence and his basketball abilities um but him him you know at that at that time be, by me being such a big fan I was incredibly upset with him and you know I, you know saying stuff like well he better come back and get the rebounds you know you, you know just being real upset with him but as I've matured and seen that that's just who he was, it's now comical. At that time, I, I called it ridiculous, but now it's something I laugh at every time I see it. Hey, hey Kamal, do you think Rodman's, I don't know, wildness, we, we talked about him before in a previous episode, and one of the things you said about him made me think, it made me wonder, was his greatness inseparable from his craziness? If, if you took all that away from Rodman, would he still be great? That's my question. No, no, he wouldn't. I think that he, they needed that. They needed that edge. And I think there's certain players who have that and you're grateful for it. I think Dennis Rodman had an entire, you know, circus show that was outside of the NBA. But again, the Ron Artesses are the same kind of way. You know, even the Draymond Greens to a lesser extent are the same kind of way that these players that, I think defy logic, you know, like you think what's wrong with this guy? Um, but it's that same edge that defenders or, you know, the opposing team can't figure out either. Like what's wrong with this guy? Why can't we stop him? Why is he going nuts on us? And I think um, I think it is inseparable. I, I think because of who he was, because of, you know, all the shenanigans, like it made him just a harder competitor. Um, I think... Dennis Rodman, again, from this super bringing, he developed this thick skin 
and in a lot of ways was impenetrable. And, and I think that's the kind of guy you want to go to battle with. Now, is that the kind of guy, you know, you want to bring to Christmas dinner? Not necessarily, but like, if you're going to go hoop, that's the guy I want on my team. <laughs> All the way. You know, I, I always say, I always say that there, there are some guys that are great to grab a beer with. There are other guys that are great to, to go to battle with. And you got to know the difference. But Robin might have been both. <laughs> 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 but you, you, you know, you, you can ask, um, some people ask, you know, how great would Rodman, could Rodman have been if, if he didn't have all of that stuff going on? And um, I think how much worse he probably would have been if, if he wasn't great. You know what I mean? Um, for, for some guys, who they are is just who they are. And they, they're lucky enough to find a context and a coach where they can harness that energy, you know, towards constructive purposes. Uh, you know, Mike Tyson comes to mind for me. Um, he, he wasn't, he didn't start off in the boxing ring making millions for fights. He started off just being a violent dude on the streets. And there was someone that he met that was like, yo, you've you, you, you got some talent, man. There, there is a context for that talent where we can use that and you can create a lot of wealth for you and your family. You can have a legacy and you can do this in a legit way. And I, and, and I think Rodman was, was fortunate enough to have people in his life who introduced him to those contacts and to those coaches that brought the best out of him. But I, I'm with you guys. I, I don't know if you can take away his personality, his unpredictability and, and still get that same great defense because you saw those same qualities on the court. He, he knew how to get into people's heads. They didn't go into that a lot in the documentary, but Rodman, I remember even in that series with Carl Malone, there were just a lot of moments where he would really agitate him. I, I remember even, even guarding Shaq. I mean, Rodman was 6'8", and that's the only dude I saw who defended Shaq respectably, you know, um, just because he knew how to agitate people. So I, I even remember when, when Magic Johnson first came back, and 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 Carl Malone was one of those players who was really concerned that you know you know is, is Magic does Magic still have his health problems you know we're going to be you know playing close to one another and the NBA had to do a lot of education on, on on what it was like to have HIV and what the risks were and were not and I remember some guys were a, a, a lot of guys were scared and when Rodman played Magic he was all over him he was all over him <laughs> like he wasn't scared of Magic a disease or anything else. It was like that guy was just so on another level of wild that he was willing to do all the things on the court that other people wouldn't do. And, and it's easy to mock off the court, but that was a part of his greatness on the court for sure. Fellas, this is the last one on Last Dance. Um, let's just wrap it up real quick with uh, with each of you guys telling me what's, what's the biggest takeaway for sport fans and non-sport fans alike who who might be seeking greatness in their own life. What's the biggest takeaway from Last Dance um, that you can share? Um, I'll say this, it's, um, you know, owning who you are, you know what I mean? Within a group, you know, there are things like identity within a group identity, you know what I'm saying? And like Steve Kerr really, really, uh, or not Steve Kerr, but John Paxson, one of you guys talked about it earlier, when he told Steve how he, he learned to embrace um, being a role player. Um, and when you figure out who you are, um, be the best at that and be comfortable with it, be cool with it, like be who you are. Like I'm a, I'm a five foot four guy with a big head, you know what I mean? But, I, but I'm cool with who I am. And so what I do is I find out what I'm good at and I try to get better at it. And when I'm better at what I'm good at around the other people that I'm around, I just make our collective better good because I'm good at what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, you know, it's tough. There, there's so many good, so many good um, life lessons that we've covered throughout, you know, the five episodes that we've done. But I think one that that is just evident is that they wouldn't have been able to achieve at this high of a level if they didn't prepare. And, and it's not just preparation for the sake of preparation, but the way 
the way that they respected the process of preparation was unmatched that that the dedication to the off season work the dedication to the late hours we especially saw that when michael jordan um was playing baseball that he you know would go um go play a game and then right after batting practice up until midnight that same night and right back up at 6 a.m batting practice like all around the clock and i think if, if you want to achieve, you know, a level of greatness, it doesn't happen once you get on the stage. It happens beforehand. I think the level of greatness, um, it, it's only manifesting because you did the work beforehand. And I think, you know, it's, it's for everybody who's listening and watching. But most importantly, it's a lesson for myself that, you know, I know that that's where um, the winning really starts is, is, is the commitment to the preparedness um, that you exercise before you get on the last stage. Yep. For me, uh, I hear the words of MJ in that commercial. I failed over and over and over again. And that is why I succeed. Uh, the, the biggest takeaway from me, just looking at Jordan's career, is that he always took his failures to heart, never took them as final, and always used them as an opportunity to figure out what adjustment he needs to make in order to come back victorious. And um, all of your failures in life can be contextualized in, in terms of a bigger picture that's larger than that moment of failure. So, you know, you lose the first two games against the Knicks at Madison Square Garden. Those are just individual games, not the series. They took those games from you, but you can win the series. You lose the entire series against the Orlando Magic. All right. That's just that one season. That's that one playoff series. You can go home and you can work on your game all summer relentlessly and you can come back and you can beat the magic next year whether it was an individual game within a series whether it was an entire playoff series jordan took every failure and said how can i learn from this how can i elevate my game how can i push myself to get better and then how can i come back and redeem those failures all of your failures in life will be the most interesting parts of your story if you can redeem those failures by transforming them into opportunities for personal development. Fellas, this has been fun, man. I enjoyed uh, talking about this series with you guys. Stro, I appreciate you joining us the last few, man. We're gonna have to get you back in the future. Uh, it's been real, brother. Hey, man, I, I appreciate the opportunity and thanks for trying to bring an old guy in, man, and uh, listen to my perspective, you know what I mean? So I appreciate it, I have fun. Thank you so much. Absolutely, we you can follow him at, at Stro Pinion. I was going to say, we yeah, needed somebody good. to defend that uh, Bulls team because we weren't going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be, we'll be uh, back here again every week. Stay tuned for more information on my Twitter. Peace out, everybody.